What is up, punks? Uh, it's Shinobi, and we're bringing you a special edition of Block Digest on Sunday, July 12th. Uh, we got Mr. Jack Maulers with us today, who uh, just dropped uh, Strike. So uh, what's, what's going on today, Jack? Yo, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Big fan of the show. And uh, I'm chilling, man. I'm chilling. Happy to be here. Chris, Janine, how are you guys doing today? Very well, thank you. Hello. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, just to kind of start it off, I mean, Strike is pretty awesome thing to fucking see drop lately, Jack. But, uh, you know, to kind of start off, uh, I guess uh, put you in the hot, so- your hot seat a little bit, uh, you know, as far as just a little bit of uh, ambiguity in the, the terms of service and like the, the kind of thresholds involved with different degrees of things. So uh, I don't know, I'm going to kind of just pass it off to Janine here. Kind of. Wait, we want to start with that? <laughs> why don't we start off with, why don't we just start off like what is strike? Mm-hmm. And then and then we can get into the hard questions. All right, I just wanted to get the get that out of the way and then get into my autistic Bitcoin banking ranting. But uh, yeah, I don't know, Jack, you want to kind of give a rundown of uh, the magic behind the scenes here? Um, yeah, sure. I'm down for whatever. Um, so Strike is a modern day type of neo bank um, that is Bitcoin first. It's built from the ground up. It's a payment stack that's natively interoperable with the Bitcoin protocol and Lightning protocol. Um, the reasons behind that is a, a much longer story, um, but I think the general movement towards neo banking, which is this uh, more digital online form of banking, like a cash app, um, my generation, um, and just generally, I think as people, we're moving away from traditional banking. Obviously, with technologies like Bitcoin, but even services like Cash App, I think J.P. Morgan Chase is dead in the water, and over the next decade. Cash apps, Venmos, PayPal's are going to continue to succeed. And uh, I think something like Strike is the next evolution of that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm super proud to kind of be on the forefront and pushing this idea. I think it's pretty novel. There's a lot of risks, and I'm sure we're going to get into a lot of the uh, regulatory compliance stuff that uh, I'm trying to battle through. But it's been a lot of fun, and uh, I'm excited to see where it goes. It's a giant experiment, um, but it's a cool one. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, when when we first covered the launch on the digest, you know, it's really like this is the first Bitcoin bank in, in my mind that's actually doing things properly, like actually baking into Bitcoin rather than just um, going, give us your Bitcoin and um, we'll give you a database entry without any kind of interaction natively with bitcoin itself or any actual utilization of of what bitcoin can offer just uh a paypal clone and i think like you you fucking nailed it here in terms of hybridizing that paypal model with that native interaction between bitcoin and that yeah i mean the the, what's really cool is the story um i've been pretty like public and transparent about pretty much everything in my life on the internet and the story um, strike was very natural in that it evolved from Zap, um, and it was this idea of Bitcoin. Historically, has had two ma- major use cases. Uh, the first one is wealth creation. That's probably the one that brings most users. Is that by somehow being involved with this thing, you get rich, or that's like that's the meme, right? Um, but it's not far from the truth. Historically, if you just buy it and hold it. Um, your wealth appreciates, uh, purchasing power appreciates. The other one is the fame censorship resistance and the whole idea behind the white paper in the first place. Um, However, all of a sudden, with Lightning in particular, we're starting to see a third because Lightning, like people are using the asset um, and a lot of these people weren't necessarily using it for censorship resistance. For a wallet like Breeze, for example, um, you're talking about people that are routing their payments through a central party like all the time if any government official wanted to go to like 
Asyncs wallet, the Phoenix wallet or Breeze or any of these like even non-custodial fairly popular wallets, um, there's no privacy involved in them whatsoever. It's There's an argument to be had whether Lightning is like a privacy preserving protocol in the first place. Um, and then obviously not wealth creation because people are spending the asset. They're not holding it and then they're not speculating on its value. So then it was like, really like, hold on a second. Are we seeing like an evolution in a third primary use case of this asset class, which didn't really exist before? Like to your point, Shinobi, it was all about Coinbase. Like the biggest businesses were these exchanges that were hoarding coins and they're using, you know, MySQL databases in matching orders. And uh, we were starting to see a, a, a new community and and type to, to use this asset and so that then it was like becomes very intuitive of like how can i best address this new target user so there's the target user that's the speculator there's the target user that's privacy censorship resistance and now there's this like new target user of using bitcoin as like a settlement rail there's payments remittances there's all sorts of like functional use cases and it, it's just about exploring that for me which is really cool because it's new yeah. mm -hmm. And, you know, there's just a, a huge aspect of that in terms of like, it's not really so black and white and binary in terms of, you know, if you want to transact, um, why use Bitcoin unless the government's literally trying to stop you? Like, it's not so much like a one or a zero there. It's, it's a spectrum. Like, Maybe I would find some utility in that, even if this is a, an allowed activity or there's really nobody out there trying to stop it. And where does that utility come in? It's more <clears throat> bridging different silos than it is um, doing something that's completely impossible to stop. Yeah. And as a, as a product guy, what, what was really interesting for me is as opposed to I don't really have a, a grand vision for Strike and how I see it impacting the world in 20 years. I think that I I rather took the approach of um, talking to people and understanding the major pain points and using this asset in, in the ambitious way that we as Bitcoiners all would like to see it be used. And then I just tried to solve those pain points and that's it, right? So the first ones were volatility, was a huge deal for people that are using the asset, like merchants accepting it, their balance sheet can be wiped out with a bad month of Bitcoin, right? And profits gone for the next year. Um, taxes was a huge, huge problem. The way Bitcoin is taxed makes it virtually impossible to spend. Um, like custody, like people don't want to hold this thing. Um, it scares them right like, like general ui ux things uh, so like all there's this little list that i ended up making of what is the the biggest pain points in using this thing and then i just tried to solve that and and then i shipped it and what's really cool is some people use strike to buy bitcoin some people use strike for remittances some people use strike for online commerce some people use strike for brick and mortar and it really has like many angles and forks and, and can go so many various ways. But uh, I took such a high level approach of it was almost worked backwards instead of, you know, I'm going to build a cool remittance app based on Bitcoin. It was no, I'm going to try and solve the friction of this asset class and then just see where the asset class takes us. Because I don't I think like it'd be a fool for me or anyone else to tell you like exactly how this is going to evolve. <laughs> so it, I think the approach to product too. I had a lot of fun with, and I, I found it really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the killer thing everybody's really excited about here is from the, the, the user's perspective, like removing that capital gains headache from the picture in terms of like, I, you know, I buy a coffee, capital gains, I buy a Big Mac, capital gains. But I, I feel like a really underappreciated part of this is on the merchant side of things. You know, like this is something I think that a lot of people really don't get in the space and probably a lot of people, um, you know, running small businesses online that accept Bitcoin. Um, when you accept Bitcoin as payment, um, it's, it's a whole lot more than just taxes. Um, you have to account for that like property, like it, legally speaking, that's not 
just dollars hitting your bank at what the price was. That's a piece of property that has to get marked to market and handled like property and distributed like property. So like, you know, a lot of Bitcoin users are really familiar with the 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 spender side of those problems, but there's a lot of those issues on the businesses side too. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it's underappreciated with Strike just because we haven't rolled out a lot of our merchant stuff yet. But you are very spot on. It's arguably a bigger deal for the acquiring, quote unquote, acquiring side, the merchant side, than the consumer. Um, for example, there's uh, the dis- some dispensaries in Boulder, including my parents' dispensaries. They use Strike to accept payment, and uh, it's so cool for a variety of reasons. One. Um, Bitcoin comes into their system and they're immediately credited dollars. So to your point, they don't have to do anything on their books, account for the property, pay any taxes, deal with any volatility. As soon as the pre-image is revealed and there's cryptographic proof of the payment, they immediately get credited U.S. dollars and that's it. Um, and so it's, it's an amazing, amazing functionality for them. What's also really cool about this, though, is it unlocks this world where the consumer has the luxury Um, and freedom to decide on what scale they want to be private and how they want to pay. Because if you have a merchant that's natively interoperable with Bitcoin and with the Lightning Protocol, sure, they can use Strike. Would that be the most private way to make a Strike-to-Strike payment? No. They could also run a Lightning node over Tor in their basement and connect to it with Zap and go pay there. And that way, like this consumer is remaining unbelievably private. Um, with a merchant that is still receiving U.S. dollars. Um, a, a large part, in my opinion, uh, an issue with privacy in the commerce and payment space is like merchants don't have a way to accept money easily, allowing their consumers to be private. Um, and this is like a, a mind fuck almost in that I can go to Starbucks and say, hey, listen, guys, let me implement Strike um, at your brick and mortar checkouts. Uh, all you get is U.S. dollars, and in fact, it's going to process so much cheaper that we can give rewards back to the consumer, or you guys can just save the extra 2.5%. I won't charge you, but now someone can walk into Starbucks and pay you with their Cash app. They can pay you with their Coinbase app. They can pay you with their Strike app. They can pay you with their Lightning node connected in their basement over Tor from their Zap app. Like, how fucking cool is that? The consumer now has the luxury of, I mean, that's the, the amazing thing about a protocol like this and the nature of Bitcoin is, is, I mean, it's an open standard. It's an open standard for value transfer. And as long as you follow the rules, you could do whatever the fuck you want. And so if we can start getting merchants and acquirers to use something like Strike, where in theory they should have no problem. I mean, they just immediately get dollars. There's no overhead. There's no cost. There's no volatility. There's no taxes. Um, and, it, and it really should open up the landscape and put a lot of power in the consumer. So the consumer can then interact with them however they want. Um, so I, I hope like to see a world soon where that's possible, where Starbucks is not opposed to strike. I've already talked to a few uh, really big like brick and mortar point of sale checkout systems in a world where you can go get ice cream and you can pay with your L and D note over tour or with Cash App, and it's it's up to you. And that's that would be a huge step forward for humanity. <laughs> in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, to to put it one way, um, I think what you have done is bring into fruition um, in the real world a old Bitcoin uncensored meme. Um, Lightning Network is the real ripple. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know, man. A fuck ripple. Uh, that's it's a a Ripple's funny meme, original though. vision. It's the Ripple original vision. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I love. Uh, I get a lot of um, with Strike. You're killing the altcoiners' uh, hopes and dreams, which I don't have the time to pay attention to their hopes and dreams. But if that's true, I fucking love it. I would love to do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you know, kind of like pick your brain a little bit about like the the back end here um you know how how does the uh the channel management and the liquidity management in terms of the strike back end work because it's really you know you you kind of have to gauge 
the inflows and outflows on the fiat side and like uh, manage that properly. And that's, you know what I mean? Like you, you've kind of taken on all the volatility risk um, so that the, the users don't have to like, how, how exactly is that structured on the back end? Yeah. Um, it's really cool and complicated obviously, but uh, you know, what's interesting is um, with my, family's trading background and i'm very close uh, chicago in particular has um a really rich prop trading uh, culture here and very now like involved in bitcoin and so not only with my dad but also with just the folks here in chicago i've gotten really intimate and involved in the trading space and uh a lot of these problems for traders are solved <laughs> like traders they are people that market make and make millions of trades a day on exchanges and they like their taxes are all automated and figured out. Like you think Don Wilson at DRW has a tax headache? Like no, the guy's been trading for two decades and and tax it like capital gains on trading Bitcoin is not a big deal. Um, and so for us, uh, all the taxes and volatility, um, we just are more or less like a trading firm in that regard. So all activity that goes through Strike, we live trade it. So we have our own trading algorithms um, and our own particular counterparties we trade with so that if someone is making an outgoing lightning payment, um, we are live trading that flow on the fly. So to give a, a quite literal example, um, let's say I have $500 in our lightning infrastructure and one user is making an outgoing lightning payment for $100 to a merchant. Um, so $100 is now leaving our lightning infrastructure, which would leave our lightning infrastructure with $400 with the previous 500 with 100 leaving. Now, then we in return as a business are getting $100 of their fiat currency. Um, so now on our balance sheet, I have $400 of the Bitcoin and $100 new dollars of, of fiat. Now the problem is if uh, we now are inherently short Bitcoin. And what that means is that if the price of Bitcoin were to go up, um, now taking that $100 worth of fiat currency and trying to purchase the Bitcoin to restock our Lightning infrastructure, I'm going to be at a net loss if Bitcoin is going up during all of this. So what's happening in real time is while the user is requesting to make a payment, we are scanning order books, fetching quotes, and doing some proprietary trading stuff. So when we actually initiate we do network probing to ensure success of the payment. And when we initiate the payment, we go and buy Bitcoin at the same time. Um, and in the reverse for a merchant where we don't want to be inherently long Bitcoin either. So we sell too. So we buy and sell like constantly all day. I mean, since our launch um, on June 2nd, so what is it? It's been one week. Uh, we're already on pace to do like a quarter million dollars worth of outgoing lightning payments this month alone. Um, and so that literally means like I'm going to be buying 250 grand worth of Bitcoin this month on behalf of strike users. Right. And then however much we don't have as much sell activity yet because we don't have um, many merchants on board, but in the reverse where we'd be live, live selling as well. So um, all of that is automated. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I didn't really address the lightning liquidity part, but was that more your question as far as the uh, volatility and, and balance sheet management? Yeah, that was kind of more what I was getting at. Because it's, you know, like um, like one of my thoughts here, um, you know, you, you guys have to kind of manage things that way, is like potentially the opportunity to drag some extra profits out of it just in the the act of trading you know like if somebody's making a payment of like 10 cents through strike i mean are, are you really going to go in an order book for a 10 cent order or try and kind of like smooth that out you know what i mean because i'm seeing potential there to kind of improve your margins as a business there yeah there's a ton of ways to uh the, the like famed everyone one of the things about launching strike that's been new for me is like everyone on the internet seems to like always be yelling at me all the time now which has been crazy and one of the most like famed things people are yelling at me is like how do i make money on this and like as if it's any of their fucking business but to your point there's so many ways um especially with the trading flow in particular yeah we we can increase margins we can um take actual positions like i'm 
like personally bullish Bitcoin. I wouldn't mind being a little bit inherently long. Um, so we can act as like a, a desk with with a bias. Um, flow itself is a commodity. Like Robinhood, for example, is a multi billion dollar business because of their consumer flow. Ours is a little different as these people aren't speculating on the asset. Um, they're literally just using it as like a settlement rail. Um, so anyways, yeah, you're spot on. I think for now, the other thing that gets lost in translation translation is like, this is very new. Like I've been just hacking on this thing with my group of guys uh, for like a few months. So, uh, so we got a lot of work to do. Obviously, this is by no means a finished product. I just thought it was good enough to uh, let everyone try and break it. So yeah, there's a lot a lot a lot we can do which is exciting a little overwhelming but uh obviously exciting mm -hmm. you know like what one of the the low uh hanging fruits i'm thinking about is um submarine swap support you know what i mean obviously to kind of start sticking um lightning natives going to be the more cost effective way uh cheaper for you for users but i mean in principle um, aside from the, the extra costs, uh, that would have to get passed on to the user. Like, I don't see any reason why you can't seamlessly, um, connect on chain stuff to this as well, without having to build that infrastructure yourself, just kind of hook into a, a sub swap service through lightning. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely like one of the higher priority items, uh, on our list product wise, I think, the decision to not include it as of today is actually more of a product decision made by me. Um, the way that I like to roll products out is be very narrow scoped. Um, I think the most efficient and effective way to build good products is to just test the market and find the truth. Um, like speculation and guesses uh, can only go so far. So my favorite thing to do is to just ship something and just be a good listener and just watch and pay attention. Um, and then you'd be surprised that like the answer is always just like right in front of your face. Um, and so I tried to keep the scope of strike, at least in its early initial beta launch phase, like very, very simple. Lightning only, generally for the consumer, no merchant tools. And then this way we can just focus on getting one thing really, really right. And then, yeah, including submarine swap support, including, including on-chain support. We can do like all sorts of really, really fancy integrations with third-party services, roll out the merchant tools. Um, but it was more of just like a, a product thing where if we rolled everything out at once, it would be, I think as a team, it'd be too complex for us to try and observe and uh, get everything correct. So I, I think that's just more of a decision I made personally, but technically speaking it's like very trivial very very trivial we've done much harder things so um yeah that's another I'm, I'm like head over heels excited to work on this thing i haven't been this excited to be building something in like my whole life i am mean, granted i've been alive for 26 years but of those 26 like this is so fucking fun to work on um it's, i can build on this thing for the next 50 years probably and still have more work to do mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's probably the right call in terms of initial launch, like because the the user experience on it is just so simple. Like I I could literally, if she was still alive, probably hand that app to my grandma, and she could fumble through and figure out how to use it. Yeah, that was the goal. That was the goal. I, there's been a lot of like diehard Bitcoiners on Twitter, which I am as well. That is like, can we get some, can we get it to display in Satoshi's? Can I auto DCA with this app? And like intuitively my gut reaction is no, like the app is kind of for your grandma. It kind of is the, the ambition is to be able to usher in a new era of Bitcoiners um, that are currently no coiners. And so, yeah, it, we want it to be dead simple and we wanted the ability and the chance to be great at that one dead simple thing that one user story, that one, like one of the metrics, I'm a data whore, I'm obsessed with data. One of the metrics that I take very seriously is the time from download to the time the user can make their first payment. And uh, over 90% of our users on iOS have accomplished that in less than one minute. 
And so like those type of statistics to me are so, so, so powerful and something I really, really focus on. And so, yeah, the ability to just launch something that's simple, it has a very defined scope, people who download it and know why they want to use it, know what they're going to use it for. Um, and if I can just spend a few months on getting that 100% correct and be the best at it, and I think we really can, then that, that was like the whole concept and idea is like, how can I get someone who maybe they don't even know they're using Bitcoin behind the scenes, um, but someone who's so unfamiliar with the asset, doesn't know what SATs are, doesn't DCA, um, but they can download it and interact with this protocol in 60 seconds. That to me is a huge accomplishment, huge accomplishment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think one of the like the last kind of back end things I wanted to get into uh, before I kind of pass it off to Janine, um, like what's your thought in terms of like channel management um, from the security point of view? like uh watchtowers and that type of infrastructure in the long term and like how how are you guys thinking about kind of rolling out and applying those types of things because you know being a, a business doing this this kind of like modern bank model um if it's successful which i think it will be um that's going to be a lot of liquidity even kind of looking at it from managing that efficiently not um just kind of brute forcing it so like that's a lot of capital um, that's live on the air. You know what? What are you guys um, thinking in terms of the infrastructure to manage that and the the security of that on chain? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a sensitive one for sure. I mean, as a business, we take it on so much inherent risk. Um, just like being involved in Bitcoin, for one, is a risk, but more particularly lightning itself is new and like as of recent it's been kind of getting its ass kicked uh and so there's a lot of unsolved problems with lightning that we're gonna have to either figure out or we're gonna get our ass burned and uh just kind of the nature of, of what we're doing so yeah in particular watchtowers lost a little bit of uh of its glow i i'm actually haven't talked to the lightning labs team about their implementation um as of recent but yeah the idea that you know if we were to scale to the numbers of a cash app that we would very likely have tens of millions of dollars at minimum in a hot wallet on in channels is like a very scary thought um some of the like more practical things i'm doing today at least is uh one like lnd allows you to configure um, who's allowed to connect to you inbound, which is really great um, because the routing algorithms aren't very sophisticated yet. And so having like a bubbling up of thousands of channels of just random people is a problem. So I'm very particular with who's allowed to connect to us. And uh, I, I like having channel partners where I have a relationship with them outside of the network. So like Alex Bosworth, Justin of BitRefill, um, and like increasing our CSV. So the, if there if there is some um, whatever disaster back to the chain um, that we have time to sweep and uh, we can do a lot of that stuff manually. I still manage a lot of it. We, we do a lot of this stuff programmatically, but a lot of this stuff to your point, Shinobi, is I like do it manually. <laughs> it's, it's so early and it's so scary. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, like we have some fairly complex stuff. Like for example, we don't just run one lightning node. We operate a slew of them um, and we roll over in case of emergency or in case of liquidity issues. So like uptime for the service is obviously very important. So that way we can like diversify our risk a little bit too, so that all of the liquidity is in, in one node or with like in one channel or one channel partner. So tiny things like that but as far as like the grand ambition and to your point um yeah i i think it's a problem we'll end up having to prioritize like i can envision myself hiring a lightning engineering team very soon um but yeah for now just raising our csv um being vocal and having good communication with our channel partners and uh ma- a lot of manual work for me <laughs> so far <laughs> I don't sleep as much as I used to. Yeah, I mean, well, it's that is kind of the state of things, but uh, you know, it seems like you're you're really kind of thinking it through. But you know, watchtowers are 
really not even here yet. Like I, I know the uh, the bare bones implementation is out there and deployed, but like those things themselves, I think are going to grow into a very complex uh, sub network and protocol of their own over time. Yeah, and I mean for us in particular, I don't know if watchtowers are like the value add for us is that huge. I mean, I initially loved the idea when I was working on Zap as you know, Zap users and online all the time. But our infrastructure is online all the time. I mean, if we can just increase the CSV and monitor it, like we should be okay. But there there's so many like things with Lightning that are uh problematic um in theory and it and, and to, to no one's fault so i just want to be clear on that it's just an early protocol like it's brand new um i think strike frankly may give the network its first test for a lot of things like we may usher on like the first real volume onto this thing and and see where it breaks um which someone has to do it so fuck it why not i'm not scared so but yeah, it just kind of comes with the territory. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I think uh, here i um, going to kind of pass the buck to uh, Janine uh, and kind of get into some of the, the terms of service and like the, the privacy model of things. But uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll come up with more uh, back-end techie stuff to get into after that. <laughs> dope. Dope. Let's do it, Janine. I'm ready. <laughs> Sounds like you're, <laughs> I, I'm not going to yell at you, I promise. Um, but yeah, so this, my, my whole, my whole interest in this um, stemmed from the fact that, you know, I've, I've known about you for a number of years and I appreciate all the work that you've done on Bitcoin stuff. Um, and, you know, I've met you and your family and I really appreciate you know, what all of you have done. And so when, um, uh, I think, I don't know when she made it, but I saw your mom, I think many, many weeks ago tweeting um, that, y- you know, they were, you guys were introducing a friend of yours to Strike and it was, I think, during the private beta launch um, and that she was saying that Strike was KYC light and that it only required a name and phone number and that was something that you also mentioned in the announcement post that you made on medium you said like it only requires a name and phone number and um i mean when i saw your announcement i read it i think a day after the launch and um the whole story that you included um which for anyone who hasn't read the announcement it's uh, i thought it was a really cute story about how you uh you got approached or you approached this uh suit man lawyer guy as you call him and he was telling you that, you know, in order for users to even open an, a, an account on Strike, they would have to provide all of this KYC information. And you were like, no, I don't think that's how it has to be. And so you um, you said that you did a bunch of research about what you would actually have to do according to the law and not according to some random consultant who's paid a bunch of money to kind of up the, the expectation for everyone. Um, but I also kind of noticed, uh, well, because I made I, I made a tweet praising the fact that you included that story and I liked it, um, and I got <laughs> I got inundated with responses to that um, publicly and privately about how some people were concerned that the marketing of Stripe or Strike in terms of how much KYC is involved and when it becomes involved and such was not very clear to people. Um, so like, for example, you know, you said it requires a name and phone number. And as far as I know, in order to just open the account, that is indeed the case. You only need a name and phone number. Um, but then obviously in your terms of service, you say that depending on the functions that you seek to utilize with respect to transactions with the account, um, your Zap's uh, risk determination may change and that may require additional screening. Um, so could you just kind of talk about that process? And I mean, in most in most cases, I know that it's not a, it's not something that businesses can talk about in terms of actually disclosing risk thresholds a lot of the time. Um, but anything that you can speak to on the, those kinds of policies, um, I think a lot of people would appreciate. Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, first of all, I. I kind of want to take this time to apologize a little bit. Not that I think I really need to, but I think like me and my family's reputation in the community so far 
has been like we're just like very good people or at least i'd like to think so um like kind-hearted i'd do anything for bitcoin this is my family and that's kind of how i've lived on on the internet is just like just be a good guy um like janine uh shinobi i've met you both in person like great people i love making those type of friends and this is the first experience i've had where i've launched a product that has reached the magnitude of like getting all of this type of like feedback and and criticism which you know i think just comes with the territory but i in no way like i i know that my point is it probably doesn't matter like i can't just say like i'm a good guy like i'm not trying to be a dick because that doesn't matter at this point like strike has reached a point to where it's exceeded like people knowing me personally so so it's new territory for me like the first few days after i launched i was having a really tough time like going on twitter and just getting my ass kicked so yeah i i'm sorry like i did not mean to introduce any ambiguity um there is this kind of like weird line of me trying to market the product and invite people to try it and also like not go to jail and then, and like i mean that literally and so you know like i'm constantly asking my lawyer my, my lawyer like reads over my blog post my lawyer actually edited my blog post before i published it and removed some things and so there's just shit like that but i do genuinely like as a human like feel bad i i like you know the last person i want to be is someone of a brian armstrong so um in no way like did i purposely do any of that and like am so far trying to give my best effort to uh to clear it up which is why i'm super happy to be here All yeah right. just to just to break in really quick um i mean i don't the fact that you're on this podcast at all is proof that you're not brian armstrong because brian yeah. armstrong would never come on this show <laughs> what was the ambiguity though jack that you alluded to just there what what did you think was could have been made clearer um so there are a few things one uh we have these limits inside of the application so for the uh suit man lawyer guy story the way that that went down it was in uh, a prop trading firm's office uh, called cmt old office now um and they had consulted a large law firm to come and hear out this idea that i had that is now strike and I'm explaining to this like really like old fart of a lawyer. Hopefully he doesn't listen to this. And he's like, doesn't understand lightning at all. He keeps asking me like where the Bitcoin address in this whole story is. I'm like, bro, we're not doing on chain, like pay the fuck attention. And then he, I, I explained for like hours and he's like, all right, well, like every, they're going to need SSN. And the fact this seems more private than on chain. So I don't think we're going to allow this at all. And it was this huge, like debacle of a thing. I end up busting my ass the last six months, like really hammering home, like what a strike user is. We got a bunch of data, like average payment size. These people bear like are are not they're not risks of laundering money <laughs> like these are micro payments these are people buying gift cards like give me a fucking break i don't want people sending me their passport and so they were like okay but you have to reason with us a little bit like we can't just like drop all of these rules that we've previously required like it makes a lot of sense actually at the time they didn't even know if i was a money transmitter because i was like where is the money transmission actually occurring i'm like a quasi processor I'm not I'm not like a your classic MTL. I think you're full of shit. I, I had to go through the MSB MTL process anyway. But anyway, this was kind of the dialogue is I was like really pushing back on these people. And so what they ended up saying for now is is between regulators and my current banking partner and us, is they said, Okay, you can minimum of phone number and name is fine. However, the maximum payment size for now needs to be one hundred dollars and the lifetime payment limit needs to be $2,000. And once they hit that, then we probably want to know a little bit more about this person. And, you know, we argued, we argued. And the idea is over the next few months, we're going to see how it goes. I think it's going fantastically well. And then our plan is to just continue to raise these limits, raise these limits. I'm going to continue to go to compliance and regulators and say, listen, you know, I'm not an exchange. People are not funneling in millions of dollars here. Um, these are really small consumers um you're hindering innovation and really setting a bad precedent for us like as a country um and so but like for example those limits weren't particularly clear um they weren't in the blog post and this idea of like well is are people going to get shotgun kyc'd 
No. Like at no point are you locked out of your account. You can always withdraw. You can always delete it. But at some point, like based on the ongoing dialogue with regulators, and the limits are in the application, um, so we don't hide them. But they're going to be changing. I'm going to try and raise them, or if I get in a lot of trouble, maybe they get lower. But at some point, you're going to get a pop-up that says, hey, listen, you spent enough. Like Now we need to know your address. And if you don't want to give your address, delete the app, whatever, and or withdraw all your money. But things like that, which I could have probably been much more transparent about, which I think people took personally and got like a little upset as if I was trying to like be sneaky. And um, I, I mean, I, I wasn't. I'm going to answer every question on here. So, but anyways, that's like an example, long-winded story of an Thank example. Thank you. No, no, that was, that was really yeah. clear. That was really clear. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, that's actually what Chris said is that he anticipated that there would be some kind of limit around $2,000 based on other businesses who engage in this kind of stuff. So that that completely makes sense. Um, yeah, the the main thing is because uh, that people were pointing out to me is that um, part of the reason you're able to do this involve and also like i like the fact that you are building a system where people can make these like public social profiles using strike and they don't necessarily have to be paid directly through the strike app they would just have this profile and as you said someone who not even is not even using strike could still pay them and be running their own lightning node and using tor and that gives them privacy and i think that's that's a really great use case because like a lot of merchants merchants and businesses they're they're already going through a bunch of other processes as part of their business where they have to you know dox themselves anyway so it's not a huge jump for them to also do it in relation to um cognito the the partner that you have and any other processes um so i like i really like that use case in particular because um, that's from the, from the merchant's perspective, that's where I see the big value add with strike. Um, but the, the concern that people had with, um, with Cognito is that, um, the, the reason people only have to give a name and phone number is because what Cognito does according to the, the privacy policy that you do include, um, in your, your own privacy policy. So hopefully people are reading that. <laughs> I, I'm a stickler for doing that. So I noticed it. Um, but yeah, Cognito, basically what they do is they take the name and phone number for anyone who doesn't know, um, and they kind of compare it against various databases, which they don't make clear um, as far as I could see in their policy about which ones they use. And most of the time they don't, but they kind of compare it against um, databases, you know, various things to basically then collect more information about you that is related to that name and phone number that you give. Um, so at some point, um, you know, if you're using a name and phone number that are tied to these things, like, uh, you know, your, your address, um, your social security number, your tax ID, those kinds of things might be something that Cognito collects, um, in the background. And that's why that policy is able to work in this case. Is that correct? Did I get anything wrong? No, that's spot on. There's one part that maybe a little wrong if I understood you correctly, is that we don't ever give Cognito um, this type of information outside of the name and phone number. The more full KYC process we do um, with our banking partner, actually. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely correct. So another thing that I obviously, just based on feedback, didn't make super, super clear is this idea of name and phone number and why I found it appealing um, is because one of the horrible things about KYC is that your information lives in like all these various different places. Basically, everything that you want to do on the internet requires you doxing your personal information with this custodian. And it's just a massive risk. Like, um, you know, if Chase Bank needs to know my social security number, okay, like, you know, I hope to be alive in a world where that's not required, but in 2020, I kind of get that. They like are my bank. Um, but does the Cash App need to know my social security number? Oh, also Coinbase? Oh, also Strike? Oh, also the fucking Uber Eats, right? Like it's ridiculous. And so the idea was like, hey, can I get away with not 
like requiring you all to shove all your shit into my app. Like, can I pull that off somehow? And that was the appeal. The appeal wasn't necessarily, hey, everyone, go get a burner phone and give me a fake name because like, <laughs> then I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like you may be able to get away with that for a little bit, but then you're going to hit these limits and like, you know, we're going to realize you're not a real person and, and then, you know, you're not going to get very far with the application. And that's not my wishes. I wish that I could offer that to you, but according to the law, I can't. So I think that there was maybe a misunderstanding, which I just didn't make clear of like why I found this whole thing exciting is like the friction of getting on board and like the requirement to give a picture of your passport to another custodian. Like, I think I may have solved that for this. And it's, you know, a user can go from download to using in 60 seconds and they're not treated like a criminal. Like strike is a place where we appreciate you and I love the people that use it. And that was more of the idea, not like, you know, so you're correct in that when you enter your name and phone number, we are doing some verification with Cognito and we're trying to figure out like, is this person real? And is this person valid? Like, am I going to go to jail for allowing this person to use my service? And, and like, you know, whatever the regulators are requiring me to do and to do these checks. And so that's 100% correct. It's not like we get a random string of digits and like a random string of characters as a name. And we're like, all right, cool. Like, go have fun. Like, we definitely are behind the scenes, not only assessing risk for compliance, but also like for fraud and all of that mm-hmm. stuff too. So yeah, that's absolutely I, correct. I, th- I just wanted to quickly jump in. So Jack, do you, so you see the innovation of this particular feature as really being uh, no more complex than a data entry issue. You're trying to make it smoother for people to sign up. And also it sounds like you're saying that you, you don't want to be uh, in custody of any of this uh, PII, any of this, this information like passports, that you just want to offload that onto Cognito. Yeah, well, not necessarily offloaded onto Cognito. Like, I think that if we can, the, the point is, your information likely is already out there. And I don't want it. If it's, if it's already out there, then like, I don't want it or need it or care for it. Even if it wasn't out there, personally, I don't give a shit about anyone else's information but my own. But you know what I'm trying to say. The point is, if it already exists out there, like if you already are a Coinbase user, for example, And by pinging Cognito with your phone number, I can get back and they can reply via an API and be, no, yeah, this person's legit. That's them. Cool. Done. Don't give me any more of your shit. I don't care for it. I don't want it. I don't want you to be treated like a criminal on my application. And I don't want you personally taking on the risk of having your personal information and assets like diversified all over the web. If I can be one service to help against that, then like that was kind of like... And, and and yeah, for UX, I mean, it's killer. It's killer. So, I think I think perhaps the, the reason why you may have got some pushback, if I may, it might be because the the culture within Bitcoin, as you know, is one of you you cited it earlier, censorship resistance, and the hand in hand with that, and the concept of privacy is consent, and a lot of what you're describing on the back end is implicit, and people don't necessarily realize that all these data points are being drawn up on them every time they interact with these services, that they have data brokers and they're sharing this data with one another, such that when they have this sort of auto magical experience, as we say in UX, when they, they sign up and it just works, TM, um, th- then they sort of, you know, being Bitcoiners and they're privacy minded, and then they, they something in the back of their mind says this was too good to be true. And I think that might be where the hostility was coming from. Yeah, I think you're right. And I don't in no way blame like the hostility. I mean, I think like some people on the internet could be a little bit nicer sometimes, but like, <laughs> whatever. Jack, so, come on, you're, you're a native on the internet. You know what the internet's like. Right, exactly. So no, I agree. I agree. Like, it, again, if I could, if I could like relaunch this thing and rewind a week, I definitely would have done a few things differently. So I agree with you. Absolutely. I also think there's like maybe a little bit of misconception of who I'm building this for. Like, I, I want everyone to be able to use it. But um, considering, you know, who a Bitcoiner, a classic OG Bitcoiner, privacy preserving Bitcoiner is, Strike may not be like the tool for them. It may be, but it may not. And I think like I can be honest and open about that too. Like if you're not comfortable with 
KYC generally, like Plaid, which I'm sure we'll get into, is another big one that like we've gotten some feedback and pushback on. I think this product has a really specific target user in mind, and um, and we haven't really got a lot of pushback from them, which uh, makes sense to me. And and I myself personally am more aligned with the OG classic privacy preserving, like. There are things I use my Lightning node that's running over Tor for, and there are things I use Strike for. And so, um, yeah, anyways, I, I think maybe that wasn't totally clear too. For some reason, I don't know how it wasn't, but it may, maybe because I you know, had spent my time building something like Zap, which was the total opposite, like absolute privacy, absolute non-custodial. Um, and maybe a lot of those Zap users were expecting some of those same properties to come with this product. And it, it just... I mean, it just doesn't make sense for what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, and so I, I definitely heard them loud and clear, which is a shame, but, you know, kind of is what it is. Yeah. I mean, from from my perspective, I like I I was never under any illusion that this type that you would be able to offer this type of service where there would be no KYC or no KYC for particular use cases. Um, like I think any anyone who understands uh you know, the way financial regulations work knows that, you know, even something like this, you can fight as much as you can within the limits, but it's also not really within your power to, you know, change the laws that you're forced to comply with in order to implement something like this. So I was, I was under, under no illusion, um, regarding this service, there wasn't going to be KYC. Um, my, my thing is purely about like representing clearly to people ha like what is happening where is their where's their data flowing to and how that's happening um but yeah since you mentioned plaid um i did want to bring that up because uh like i said you mentioned cognito in your privacy policy so people who read that will be aware that you have that that relationship um but then also part of the um, announcement of strike there was press releases about the fact that you will be partnering with visa in the fast track program and that stuck out to me because um as i said i was getting a lot of people responding to me telling me to look into um plaid more and so for anyone who doesn't know um plaid is basically a financial technology uh company that um, works with a lot of different payment apps uh that basically allows you to connect your bank account to these payment apps they're the one who kind of facilitates that um for example, uh, when because uh, and the reason this is interesting is because Visa um, actually acquired them. Um, I don't know precisely when, but it was announced in like January, I think, that they had acquired Plaid for five point three billion dollars. And um, in an article by CNBC, I think it was CNBC. Uh, let me check really quick. Yeah, CNBC. Um, they said that Plaid's API software, often referred to as the plumbing behind fintech companies, lets startups connect to users' bank accounts. It's well known among financial technology developers, but the average person interacting with it most likely won't recognize the name. High profile Plaid customers include uh, popular peer to peer, well, we know that's not really peer to peer, but peer to peer payment app, Venmo, uh, mobile investing app Robinhood, and cryptocurrency exchanges, Coinbase, and Gemini. Um, so yeah, basically the chances are relatively high that if you've used, uh, any of these popular payment apps, you most likely have, and connected a bank account, you most likely have, uh, some kind of profile that Plaid, um, has stored because they are handling this and they've gotten into a bit of controversy recently because, uh, there's actually a class action lawsuit that I found today that was launched in May where, um, because uh, for anyone who doesn't know, if you look at the privacy policy for Plaid, um, it lists like a ton of information that they take or have access to when you give them permission to basically connect your bank account to these payment apps. Um, it basically, any anything and everything in your bank account, you should assume that Plaid has access to it if you've used these payment apps and connected a bank account. Um, so I don't know... I, I I didn't see anything that indicated that you have a relationship with them yet or not, um, but I assumed based on the fact that you're going to partner with Visa that that could come into play. So I was wondering if you could say anything about that. Yeah, for sure. 
It's actually funny that uh, Visa acquired Plaid because our relationships um, to date have been entirely separate. So Visa and I um, have been kind of like Bitcoin friends for a long time, believe it or not. So we are now publicly announced that we're coming out with a card that backs um, the Strike app, which I can talk about, I think is cool. Also a few other things to do with Strike. But generally speaking, they're big fans of Lightning and we have some like really, really ambitious plans that I can't really talk about yet. But um, that's separate. Plaid, our relationship with Plaid is very simply like I signed up on the website and put down my debit card and we pay on like a per API call basis. Um, the folks at Plaid actually are Bitcoiners as well and they're users of Strike. So we've become friends, but like not in, in a business way. Uh, and it's pretty much that simple um, as far as relationships go. But uh, yeah, as far as the product, um, it's correct. Like their documentation is public and you can go on there and read through exactly what information like people can gather from their interaction with Plaid. Like it can get all the way down to like your credit score, <laughs> like or what assets you own or like the current balance of your bank account. We don't uh, install those like permissions in our Plaid widget. Um, we just do the very bare minimum of what we need. Uh, but th there's no way for us to prove that our, like our code is an open source. So like, you c I mean, I mean, I can just tell you on the podcast, but I'm not saying that as if you should take it to your grave or anything. Um, but yeah, I think the decision to go with plaid for us, um, was multifaceted one user experience. Uh, it's killer. Also though, um, you have to think about, um, so this idea of like how we get fiat currency from the consumer, like there's this debit card rail, there's ACH, and then there's maybe instant ACH products like Zelle or things like that. Um, the, the problem with debit card and ACH is you take on chargeback risk and fraud and everyone knows that that's a potential problem. Um, so may I, when I first looked into instant ACH and things like Zelle, it's actually not very appealing for a few reasons. Like one, we want to convert these users. We don't want to be pushing these users to Zelle, to the banking like cartel. Um, and then the other problem is it's just too big of a TTP. Like it's just too big of a central point of failure. For example, Bank of America just came out and said, anyone that's using Zelle for Bitcoin related anything, we're going to shut everything of yours down immediately. And so can you imagine if I had built Strike on Bank of America Zelle integration, like I'd have to close the company in the app. <laughs> like that's fucking ridiculous. So Zelle and Instant ACH in their nature of having no chargebacks, um, which is appealing, it just didn't make any sense. So then the question is, okay, ACH, because and debit cards are very expensive. Right now our parent processor charges us 3.9% per transaction. And so we pass that directly on. And so no one really uses debit cards on strike. Never have. And I don't think they ever really will. The ACH is free. ACH debit is like how we all transact. Like when you order an Uber, when you order food for delivery, when you buy Bitcoin on cash app, it's like almost always ACH debit. Um, and so when I started doing this research, I was like, okay, um, Robin Hood, who you know, through different types of business relationships, I've become close with. Um, I'm like, how are you guys solving this? Because they take on the same type of risk. And when they first launched their ACH reversals and fraud risk was like in between five and 10%. It was very, very high. Nowadays, it's like far under 1%. And so it's like gives you insight that this is like a relatively solvable problem. And they walked me through their relationship with Plaid, how they use Plaid. And as like a really young startup, it's just the most friendly, easiest way for us to get up and running and get something shipped where I'm not just getting my ass kicked left and right, like with fraud or, or other payment problems. Um, and so it was a combination of UX and also that like just mentors kind of walking me down the fiat world and showing me the ropes. And I just signed up for an account and we just integrated it. Um, but yeah, I mean... Again, like you're entering entering your bank account information into a service that isn't your bank. So like if you're uncomfortable with that, I 100% get it. 100% get it. It strikes just probably not the app for you. Neither is Cash App, neither is Coinbase. Like you should go download L&D from source and run it over tour type of thing. Um, so, but I mean, for those that want 
support for other ACH, like just entering your bank account information, like routing number and account number. Like we can definitely do that. Um, like, you know, again, we're like super new. And so one step at a time, but, uh, plaid for us very simply was like just the easiest way to get up and running. Um, and is just the most highly recommended service really. Yeah. The, I mean, the particular concern with plaid, um, at least according to the class action lawsuit is that like, yes, um, you know, this is how their service operates and they do have a privacy policy where they spell that out. Um, but for a lot of the applications that were using it, um, the concern was that they were not sufficiently disclosing that or referencing that in the process of the user signing up and connecting their bank account. And so a lot of users aren't even aware that Plaid is a partner of these companies and that Plaid has access to all of this information. And at least uh, according to, um, I mean, I didn't, I don't think it was in their privacy policy, but they may be obviously accessing the bank account more than once um, to uh, to check this information and you know they'll see your payment history and all of the other things and so that was the concern that it wasn't being disclosed well enough and also there um, there's also an allegation in there that plaid besides you know collecting this information either automatically or just as part of its process was um was becoming more of like a data broker where they weren't just using that information in order to operate their business they were they were starting to pass on that information to others that was not that was not really necessary as part of offering their service to these companies and so i just wanted to clarify that that was the issue yeah definitely you know what's really interesting I don't know if this is, I think I'm allowed to talk about this. Um, it may be influenced by the lawsuit that you're referencing. I didn't know that that was a thing, but, uh, plaid reached out to us and we had to go through this like giant vetting process of exactly how we use them. And because of how we use them, they deemed that like we are okay, but they were asking like what we do with the information. Like clearly someone came down on them and was like, Hey, what you guys are doing, like needs to be more transparent and clear. And like how people are using you guys needs to be more transparent and clear. So it wasn't too long ago, actually, it was like a month ago where I had to go through this like crazy rigorous process with them, like fill out a million Excel sheets about like how we use the data, like our security practices. And for us, like we just leave it on the default. Like I said, we don't like pull any information. Like we just literally want you to be able to like send us the money. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, no, uh, it's it's a thing. It's a thing. Plaid is um is a company that uh, has a reputation now that isn't great. Um, and so yeah, I, I'm looking forward to support more and more ways for people to give us fiat currency. Um, Plaid was just the easiest, but uh, it sounds like it may not be the best. So yeah, yeah. to um to end it on kind of, I mean, I think it's a relatively higher note, but um. I saw that one of the questions uh, you've been answering on Twitter because you haven't, you know, you don't have as much time to go on <laughs> on podcasts all the time to answer questions like you are now. But one of the questions you answered on a Twitter video was um, the fact that your terms of service uh, supposedly excludes um, various types of businesses or users who might want to um, use Strike for things like you know, mar buying something from a mar marijuana dispensary or adult content. And that was a confusing point for people. But in the video, you explained that that's on a state by state basis. Like ev everyone pretty much knows at this point that your your parents run one and that's a legal business. And so they would be obviously al allowed and fine with using strike. But uh, is there anything you want to kind of share with people about that general situation and how complicated it is? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So one of the users was like, hey, asshole, you've been telling us that your parents have been using this to accept payments and how it's great for buying weed. And then in your terms, it says, hey, in certain jurisdictions, don't buy weed. And he's like, why are you a liar? And basically, and I was just like, the, the thing is, 
um, like what I'm advertising with my parents is totally cool. It's a legal business. Marijuana and cannabis is legal in Colorado and uh, that business is regulated and legal and everyone knows we're using strike and is totally legal. Now, what I can't do is be like, yo, everyone in New York, like meet up at Washington Square Park and use strike to buy pounds of Kush. Not allowed. I will go straight to jail. And so I didn't write the terms. My lawyer did. Um, and it's just like his job is to keep me out of prison and allow me to keep building. And so right. that's more or less like all, all that it is. It's that, yeah, it, in some ways, like I've actually reached out to a lot of uh, adult film actors and actresses where these people don't have the privilege of financial access that someone like myself does. And that's really unfair. And I think that if I was allowed, if they were allowed to have a strike public profile or a strike widget to process payments where someone can download strike, pay them, or like someone running a full note on tour doesn't want their wife know that they watch porn, wants to privately tip these people, that's cool too. I think it'd be a fantastic service. They'd get fiat currency. They wouldn't know they're using Bitcoin, but they'd get a lot of the power that Bitcoin offers. Um, And so I'm trying to figure out ways to help those type of people. But I also like, if it's not legal, then like there's nothing I can do about it. So yeah, that, I mean, that's really as, as simple as it is. Um, Lawyers just being lawyers. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I assumed um, because, you know, you just launched and so you haven't had time to go through every single nuance of how your policies can be interpreted. And obviously those are written by lawyers and, that has to do with the whole, you know, the element of the lawyer has to understand how your your product and service works, and then they also have to understand the legal consequences, and that can be very complicated. Um, do you know, are you able to say, like, is your lawyer particularly knowledgeable about Bitcoin in general, um, or... Or is this is this something that they had to get trained to or get instructed on, like how this technology works and how that should be reflected in the policies that you write? Um, so the lawyers that I make fun of in the blog post are from a long time ago. My current counsel, I love to death. I think they are so amazing. They are familiar with uh, Bitcoin. They've been in the space for a super long time and have worked with all of the well-known companies that are regulated um as well as not like they also um work with apple for example um they're as good as it gets i think they're great i mean um they do know bitcoin but for what we're doing there's a learning curve for everyone including myself like we're doing some pretty novel shit, and so they're always learning and and they they really want to understand not only because i think that they're good people but also it's going to help their business. I think we won't be the first to do what we do. Um, and so, yeah, we have phone calls pretty much all the time, like at least a few times a week uh, where we're not only discussing work stuff, but also like what a pre-image is, what an HTLC is, et cetera, et cetera. Like really allowing them because I mean, it just scales better that way. Like um, it makes everyone's life easier if these people understand this technology um, truly. So uh yeah i i'm a big fan of them i I think uh like they have a really hard job man they really do uh and um just like i write bugs in software um i think like there's some parts of my terms of service that i don't think are perfect but um i don't know i i'm gonna ride they've they've like done an amazing job they've fought for me for this uh like kyc stuff they fought for me for banking relationships they fought for me for so much they actually like really have had my back this is the one law firm i went through maybe a dozen of them before i found these guys and uh yeah this is the one law firm that's had my back and uh i've been impressed like with their character and principles so um yeah until until they turn on me i'm i'm gonna keep uh praising them honestly i think they've done a good job so far Hey, Jack. All right. Well, that you know, was uh, that was that was uh, the end of my fire. <laughs> I wanted to ask. I survived. You did. You did, and you did really well as well, Jack. But I do have a question for you. You know, in uh, finance, have you come across a saying yet that uh, in finance, even the good guys get dirty? Yeah. Uh oh. Yes. It- 
<laughs> you'll probably come across someone's going to say it to you eventually, man. But you, you're taking on a task that goes all the way back to like Bit Instant, Charlie Shrem. Every time someone tries a crypto product, especially Bitcoin, interfacing with legacy finance, it's arrows in the chests, you know, of the of those frontiersmen. And I wonder, you've jested a few times about prison. I noticed in one of your other interviews, you even said you were too cute to go to jail. But how much pressure do you really feel like you're under with this? Because it all, your, your reputation precedes you. You're a crypto native. You've been around in Bitcoin for a long time. You're incredibly prolific. You, you, you're a builder. You ship things. How much pressure do you feel like you're under right now? Um, from a compliance standpoint, uh, not a ton. I think the like too cute to go to jail and, and I'm going to go to prison stuff. Um, obviously partly true. Like if I break the rule, I can't, that can't happen, but it's also a little bit of a meme that represents this greater idea that I am like running a regulated business and I have to follow the rules. Um, but I don't, I've never felt like I've been at serious risk of going to jail so far. Um, it's it's a little bit of of a meme to proxy into this greater idea that I think everyone conceptually understands. Um, but yeah, I think um, more high level. Uh, I think there's a lot of pressure, honestly. Um, like I don't. I mean, I, I it just comes with the ambition, though. Uh, it's kind of like what you said. I love building things. I've always been ambitious in this way. And um, it comes with the territory. I'm not really scared. And I feel like in my heart of heart, I'm doing what I think is right. Like for Bitcoin, I think I'm helping Bitcoin. And I think I'm helping the world in the best way that I personally can to my own capabilities. And I'm very aware that I could fail, that uh, I could get mixed in with some bad people, um, mixed in with some enemies. And... Uh, yeah, I'm conscious of that. And uh, I'm conscious of all the opinions and what everyone says online and on Twitter. But uh, I wouldn't really have it any other way, man. I really wouldn't. I have I had one job where I was working for the man for like six months. And that's as long as I, I could have lasted. So I would rather go down trying personally. And uh, sometimes it is a lot of pressure and it's, it's hard. But um, it's just the way I think I've just decided to li live my my life this way. So I accept it. I accept it for the good and the bad. Um, I don't like I don't ever feel like a victim or feel bad for myself. It just uh, comes with the territory of, of what I want to do. Yeah, that's great. Well, look, I hope that um, you keep answering those hard questions and, and don't take the, the trolls, don't let them grind you down. But uh, when there are hard questions to, to be asked, I, I have confidence following this that, that you will keep coming back and, and answering those. And I think so long as you do that, I think you'll always have the community behind you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, like Bitcoin holds such a special place in my heart um, for so many reasons. Um, but it, it really is like become the nucleus of our family. Um, and like my parents and I have never been closer. Um, so I really like, I owe everything to these people and, uh, I don't take a lot of their trolling too personally. Um, I know that, uh, everyone's intentions are good. And I believe that these people are behind the technology that's going to change the world for as long as I'm alive in it. So, um, but yeah, I, I listen to them with like great intent all the time. So, yeah, going to continue to do my best. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're nailing it, man. Like you're taking the technology of banking into the 21st century. And, you know, everything, uh, you know, Janine and Chris took you through. Um, you're fighting the fight in terms of what can you actually legally get away with or, or facilitate within that framework and trying to push those boundaries, like widen that space. Yeah. I told you Shinobi off the record, but you know, strikes already had acquisition offers um, for like money that like as a 26 year old, like I would be fine. And uh, I turned them all down. I think maybe like in a long time, Hopefully people look back on my efforts and my family efforts and not like in any about like money or accolades, but more like 
I'm just trying to do a lot of work to give Bitcoin a, a space in this world that's like respected and we can build software that doesn't treat people like criminals and that removes a lot of this like baggage and reputation that it's had. And that maybe Cash App just like totally copies me, steals all of my ideas, but then the world would be like a much better place for it. And I think a lot of the groundwork I did would, would matter, irregardless if I go on to do it or if someone else does. So yeah, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. And like no one can really take that away from me or my family. So we're super proud of that aspect. Um, lose or fail or uh, win or lose, excuse me. I think uh, so far I've just like had a lot of fun uh, really like fighting fighting the man and giving Bitcoin a place. Like I think strikes accomplish a lot already, even in its little tiny beta. That would be a that would be a weird situation indeed if uh, Jack Dorsey <laughs> decided to try and take over Jack Mahler's uh, business. The Battle of the Jacks. <laughs> I wouldn't hate it. I'd, that'd be an honor, actually. I'm a fan of his, so if he's listening, let's do it. Mano y mano. I'd shit my pants if I found out Jack Dorsey listened to this. <laughs> yeah, me too. That would be great. Don't okay. ban me from Twitter, Jack, please. <laughs> All right, but um, yeah, you know, I'm personally, uh, you know, out of questions and things to dive down. I mean, uh, Chris or Janine, you guys got any more questions you want to ask? No, I'm good. Uh, no, just wanted to say that, uh, full disclosure, I was at a brief moment a customer of your parents because I bought I bought a case from their store. <laughs> It had nothing to do with marijuana. It was just a case because I thought it looked cool because I think it was a lockbox. So just full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I don't know why you didn't buy marijuana, but you should have next time. I I am an extreme prude when it comes to alcohol and drugs, as Shinobi very well knows. Um, but also mm -hmm. as as a also just want to clarify um, as an you know anarchist and all voluntarist and all that I am not against other people putting substances in their bodies if they so choose but yes I unfortunately will never be a customer in that way fair enough you can leave all the alcohol and uh, marijuana to Shinobi and I will take care of it mm-hmm I can attest to this. I spent multiple days getting completely shit faced in Berlin. She didn't take a single drink. I respect that. I respect that. I've been shit faced far too many times in my early young years. And so I respect uh, that, Janine. Good for you. <laughs> that, that reminds me Chris is going to ask if you have any whiskey. I do have whiskey. Yeah, of course. Always. Yeah, I yeah, noticed the, the, the other, other morning you were on the you were on one of the interviews and you had like a morning whiskey going on there. Oh my god, man! I hadn't slept, and uh, one of my best friends in the world, um, who helps me, he he works for uh, Zap and Strike, and he helps me prepare all these blogs and just like my right hand man, ride or die guy, and uh, we look at the clock and we're like shit i have to do an ama i haven't slept like i can't see straight and we're like what are we gonna do and he runs in the kitchen he's like i got it i got it and he just hands me a tall glass of, of neat whiskey and he's like here you go buddy take a swig and have fun and so i've just fucking no sleep drinking whiskey uh barely even like remember that but yeah that's the full transparent context of that one <laughs> i well, don't always drink morning whiskey but that one particular morning i did you're never going to get Brian Armstrong coming on into an interview and just talking like this. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know, this is a, this is a real fun one, uh, Jack. You know, appreciate you stopping by and, uh, and taking the beating like a man. So uh, thanks for coming by. Yeah, much love, guys. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right, so I guess uh hope everybody enjoyed, and I will catch you for the next one, punks. I'll feed us in. Bye.